Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Cliff Vanderpool, director of the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum, located on the campus of West Texas A&M University in Canyon, Texas. With more than three million artifacts and objects in the collection covering the human and natural history of Texas, its art, culture, and economic and social development, the museum serves more than 70,000 visitors annually. Vanderpool previously served as executive director of the Texarkana Museum Systems of three museums, and was the curator of the Dallas Historical Society. He is also a past president of the Arkansas Museums Association and of the Texas Association of Museums. He has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Cliff, for joining us today. Thank you, great to be here, Mark. So this museum is a museum of place. It uniquely belongs in Texas, and it tells the history of an entire region. Talk about the museum, its place within the constellation of museums in Texas, and the guiding philosophy that, that informs your programs and your curatorial work. Well, it is the largest history museum in the state. And uh, you, when it, you think about the panhandle of Texas, you're really thinking about the geographic area of the state of New Jersey. Uh, it's a huge area. And we also cover eastern New Mexico, southwestern Kansas, southeastern Colorado, and the Oklahoma panhandle as well. So our service area and our collecting emphasis is, is very broad. It is about the region, uh, not only its history, but also its our artistic expression. And so we have a significant collection of paintings from the Taos and Santa Fe colonies that started in the early 20th century. Our philosophy is to inf let the visitor have an experience that's rich and immersive, that is engaging, to any level they want to go, um, whether that's using technology in exhibits or if that's just briefly reading a label. Uh, we want them to be able to go as deep into a subject as they wish uh, or to just pass by however they might. So it's a, it's, it's a museum. It, it, it allows people to muse, to think about yes. their own experience and to also experience um, the, the, the history of the area without necessarily referencing the current political boundaries as they current as they exist today that's right uh, you know there is not an awareness of New Mexico Oklahoma uh, Texas lines in, in the in the museum at all it's a, it's an immersive experience and that's one of the things we always talk about in our staff meetings is what are we going to do to get the visitor into this to have a deeper learning experience so let's deconstruct the, the museum for a bit, because this is not just about human history and human culture, but it's, nor is it about the, um, the culture and history of one subgroup. Uh, so let's talk about the, the breadth of the collections, because they are, they are truly extraordinary. They are. We have collections from uh, the archaic period. We have an uh, ex excellent paleontology collection. Uh, we have a uh, history of the people that first were in this area. Uh, of Texas, the, the Archaic Indians, and then a group of people called the Antelope Creek people that lived north of uh, what's now Amarillo from about 1000 to 1400. So when the environment was also uh, considerably different than, yes. than it is today. Yes. And the same drought that affected the cliffside dwellers of Mesa Verde drove these people away too in about 1350, 1400. So we cover ethnology, um, we cover the Anglo settlement of the region, the conflict between the Anglos and the Native Americans that were in the region. Uh, then we go into 20th century history, and it, it, it broadens quite a bit because the museum addresses the history of the petroleum business and the panhandle. And uh, automobiles are in the collection. We also have a significant uh, collection of paintings from, as I said earlier, from the Taos and Santa Fe art colonies. And believe it or not, Eastern American and European art, because there, were, there was a great deal of wealth created in the panhandle in the early 20th century. And uh, these people were avid collectors, and they bought significant pieces. And their estates, they passed it on to the museum. We also have a, a large uh, library and archives collection. It's about 35,000 historic photographs, uh, historic maps, oral histories, uh, rare and out-of-print books um, about the history of the region, also um, transcripts from 
the WPA interviews that were done oh, in the interesting. 30s. Oh, interesting. So, so this is the history that, that could be threatened with disappearing as we become more of a, of a national, indeed international society. Um, one sometimes has to worry that the regional character of our country uh, is being lost. Right. This sense of place is what we want people to have a feel for when they come to our museum. That the Panhandle of Texas is rather unique. It's settled very late in U.S. history, actually, in the 1870s uh, by the Anglos who come in. It's, um, it is very common to meet somebody who says, yes, uh, my grandmother came here in a covered wagon in 1900, and they lived in a dugout until the 1920s. Now, that being said, every, I think every part of the country wants to have a sense of its own uniqueness. It's disappearing uh, the, with large urban centers. Say Atlanta has taken over most of North Georgia. Right. Does the South have a particular culture anymore that's unique to the South? I don't know. Uh, but I would say that the, the West still does that. And part of that is just because of the space. You know, when I tell people that it's about a 12-hour drive from Amarillo to Houston, they just can't believe it. And so that space is something we want people to have a feel for in the museum. And what is also interesting is the, is the incredible diversity uh, within Texas, and particularly uh, regional diversity. So you have a story of not only individual cultures, because there is not just one unitary Texas culture, there's not a South Texas culture per se, uh, there might be some aspects that bind these different regions together, but it is incredibly rich. And then there are different peoples who are intersecting and interacting, and through history that interaction uh, starts to unfold in different ways, in, in art and artifacts, in the visual arts, in the tools that allow people to, to pursue their own economic well-being. Yes, it is, it is very diverse. And, the economy of, of South Texas is fundamentally different than the economy of the, of the Panhandle. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things we want people to understand. Et different ethnic groups are in different parts of the state. Central Texas is great German heritage. The, the Valley, long time, many generations Hispanic uh, people. The Panhandle actually has now a tr very large and significant Southeast Asian population. And I joke that the best Thai food in, I've ever had is in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, is because in the 70s, Amarillo was a, a center for Catholic family services, and they relocated a lot of Southeast Asians uh, to Amarillo. And they're a very important part of our community, and we, we work to tell their story as well. Chat about managing this institution. Give us a sense of its dimensions, um, its, its uh, budgets, its, the, the range of activities that it engages in. Well, we are on the campus of West Texas A&M University, and the building was started, the first part was built in 1933, partially funded by WPA funds. It's a unique um, Spanish Art Deco, Southwestern Art Deco style. And the it, building itself is supported by the university. That's right. But the yes. collections are owned by the, by the museum. Yes. It's, the way to look at it is the Pan Ana Plains Historical Museum is the structure, right. and we're all university employees, everybody that works there. The Panhandle Plains Historical Society owns the artifacts, has the endowment the art. and the art and the collections, determines policy about use and exhibit development, and um, uh, basically owns everything in the building. So it is a true public-private partnership with about 25% of our budget coming from the state of Texas through the university, and that accounts for uh, roughly 50% of our staff salaries. And what we do is actually we transfer money to the university to pay for the rest of our staff. Oh, okay. So everybody is a state employee with the benefit packages that are available, uh, but we're actually transferring money to the state to cover 50% of our staff. Our annual budget's about 2.1 million uh, that's just for doing what we do. Now, the university probably spends about $400,000 a year on our building maintenance and utilities. So $2.5 million, roughly. Uh, we have a staff of 18 full-time. Uh, we have a lot of part-time. And then we have uh, 
contract security guards. So we're open most days of the year. I think we only close four days of the year at this time. Uh, there are several departments. There's archaeology, art, history, uh, what I call special projects uh, department. And that person, she actually does special exhibits that don't fall in any given category, but she also does our adult education program. Interesting. And then, of course, education, collections, fundraising, marketing. Marketing plows the ground for development. So many museums say, oh, we need a development director. And the problem is nobody knows they're a museum. Nobody knows they're there because they don't have any marketing efforts. And if, if the, you can't have successful development without good marketing, so well, we're very fortunate. It, so, it, so marketing, in many respects, drives awareness, which drives both contributed and earned income. It also drives audience. Um, and it drives an awareness of the place of the institution within the community. Yes, it, it does. Uh, and 60% of our visitors come from the Panhandle region, 40%. Uh, roughly 40% come from outside the Panhandle. We do a lot of uh, visitor tracking. You know, that's one thing when I do a, a map visit for a museum assessment program or accreditation, and I'll, I'll find out a museum doesn't do visitor surveys. I say, well, how, how do you know who's not coming if you know who's coming? We really want to know where people are coming from. What, where's our audience? And the interesting thing was in 2009 was actually the best year for attendance in, in 40 years for the museum. 2009. 2009. That's interesting. It was. That's really interesting. We went through the roof in 2009. I think it was the economy. Nobody was traveling. Nobody was doing anything. But uh, it was a banner year. So let's talk about uh, a bit about the infrastructure that, that allows you to so blithely rattle off the, the, the statistics. It seems that you connect your your finances, your investments in, in staff time and volunteer time. You even have an ability to talk about the economic impact. And maybe you can talk a bit about that economic impact and, and, and how you bring this data together. Well, I think essentially museums are a business. And we, we have a unique product. It's not anything we sell for people to wear to take home. But so it's not a watch. It's not, it's a, not watch. a pair of shoes. It's not a pair of shoes. I know they may buy a watch or a, pair, or a sh t shirt in the gift shop, but we, we have a unique product, and that's museum based education, a museum learning experience. And our approach at the museum, and uh, what we've worked for the last seven years, is making that engaging and relevant and asking ourselves about everything is this a relevant relevant to our mission, relevant to our community, is it going to be engaging? Is it interesting? Is it enjoyable? Yes. Is it educational? Will people come back? We're selling an experience. That's what we do every day. We're selling an experience. And the way we know that the experience is working is by knowing that visitors from the Amarillo Canyon, Texas Panhandle region are coming back uh, the a majority of our visitors come back two or three times a year. So that's the importance of knowing that 60% of your audience is from the region, being able to parse that audience out, know who is not attending and who is attending, targeting the people who are not attending, and ensuring the people that are attending that they come back. And then you also take a look at the 40% who come from outside of the region, and then you go after those people as well. And that, that ties back to your point on marketing. I think that the, the great thing about the Pan Ana Plains Museum and the staff that we have there is uh, we have a very interdisciplinary approach. Uh, and one of the things we did was is break down, you know, you know, the buzzword, the cliche, break down the silos. The curator of art will will sit in on meetings with archaeology uh, and with their exhibits, and the marketing is involved in every ex exhibit development and program development idea. Do you have integrative? Uh, ex exhibitions where you take um, visual artworks, ethnographic material, yes. um, perhaps uh, other material from the, from the region and combine them into, into a exhibitions that, that... We do. One of them was, uh, was actually on energy. Now, if you really want to get controversial in the Texas Panhandle, talk about energy. Okay. Obviously, great fortunes were made from oil and gas, but the region is, is leading the nation in wind power right now. 
in the issues the transmission lines so in the exhibit we tracked the the past where we've been on energy development where we are now and where we may go and so this integrated approach to the exhibit included things from our geology collection included uh, the stories of the native americans and using actually uh, would be tar pits for for development of some of their tools uh, also the idea that wind power is probably the oldest form of energy people have ever used is the idea of sailing ships. Uh, and art was worked into the exhibit because there were great scenes painted in the 30s of the oil field camps and of the oil, oil field workers. Uh, Jerry Bywaters, a Texas artist, uh, did a great painting of called Oiled Field Gals and two women about to hitchhike out of town. Uh, in a far west te Texas uh, oil boom town in the 30s. So it, the exhibit combined geology, some archaeology, art, but also addressed this very, very important issue of here's where we are, where are we going? And it was very open-ended. We didn't come down and say oil's going to go away, you know, wind is the only way, you know, they have feedlots in Amarillo, so Let's, uh, let's use tap all that cow manure and make energy from that. So we, we left it all open-ended because we want, we want people to, do, to make their own conclusions. We're finding that our uh, use of technology is very popular. We offer cell phone tours, uh, QR readers, um, and a variety of other sources that integrate music into the exhibits. And we find from our visitor surveys that people really like that. They like to be able to hold up their iPhone and to the QR code and go straight to the website with that. And explore what they would wish to explore. It gives yeah. them also a sense of control rather than reading labels that somebody else determine is, is what they need to see. Mm -hmm. They can actually look themselves. Yeah. And one of our most popular programs in the last year was we had a Constitution, Constitution Day at the museum. And people, were, you know, people would wonder why why are you having Constitution Day at the museum? Well, it's a, it's a celebration of, of our civic responsibility, really. The museum is a place of ideas, and Constitution Day was a way to celebrate our country's uh, founding document, but we also had a ceremony where 22 uh, people were sworn in as U.S. citizens. Oh, really? There at the museum. Oh, that's interesting. So you have the combination of the, uh, of the civic experience of a becoming an American and talking about how the founders thought about becoming a nation. It was a very successful event. And part of that was a simple little interactive with a, with a global map where people could put a post-it with their name and where their family was from because we are a nation of immigrants. And it's important to remind ourselves these facts that, and uh, address these issues Immigration is not a 21st century issue. It goes way back. You know, there was a party, the Know Nothing Party yes, from the 1840s. the Copperheads. Yes, the Copperheads. Well, it's interesting that, that you deal with uh, some very sensitive issues, the interaction of different uh, groups, but you seem to come at this without a, a, um, a judgment in terms of who is right and who is wrong. You seem to set the stage for a, di for a dialogue, but then you invite everybody to the table to interact with the exhibits and then discuss amongst themselves. Is, is that an expression of, of the sensitivity of the, of the institution itself, of, of, of your institution? I think so. I think that our approach is, is not to alienate, but to engage. But to, to engage. But not that not that we wouldn't present something that would be considered controversial because that could alienate somebody. We'll do that, but we're also going to present the other side. One of the things we do in our education department is throughout our exhibits and at different points, not everywhere, but there'll be a, a little insignia like a uh, like a puzzle, a couple of puzzle pieces going together, and it's uh, called "Come Make Your Connection," and it'll offer a leading statement for the visitor to further identify with the object or, or the painting. So uh, we had an exhibit of, from our uh, archives, library and archives collection of historic photographs. And one was of a schoolhouse in 
1905 in the Panhandle. It was pretty bleak, pretty bleak. And so the, the question was for the students, how has cla the classroom changed? Just so they could, just so they think well, that about must, it. That must be fun. You know, just so they can think about these issues of, of comparing their real world experiences today to what an eight year old did in 1905. And you also are begging the question of how does society invest in education? And, and are tax dollars at work, are resources at work to, to shift realities on the ground for young people? So rather than standing in front and lecturing and then writing articles and writing books and so on, you were really interested in a broader audience? Getting it, getting it to people who may never ever go to college or getting it to a child I, that may or may not ever go back to the museum again, depending on what happens with their family situation. Um, I like in my, compare my job to maybe a symphony conductor. The conductor may not know how to play every instrument, but the conductor knows how to bring it together. And I think that's my strength, is to, to pull in the expert in the art department, to pull in the experts in our archeology span department, to get a team together to define the exhibits we want to do for the next five years. We, we do a lot of extensive planning and uh, to use the resources available. And I, what I try to encourage all staff to do is to think creatively and to think about cooperation in the various departments and also to bring in community members who may be able to offer something to the project. And that's, that's been successful. What does the future of the museum uh, look like over the next several years? We're focusing on doing uh, gallery renovations. We know that one part of our museum called Pioneer Town is tremendously popular with our visitors. But Pioneer Town is in the structure, a wing built in 1966, and it was historic yeah. buildings right. in, in this section of about 11,000 square feet gallery. And uh, you basically went into what was a recreation of a Pioneer Town and walked on linoleum and saw it under fluorescent lights. All that's gonna be changed. And also the visitors will be able to go into the structures. The lighting will be, will be completely different, the flooring. So, and then we're gonna go on and address the petroleum wing. And what we're gonna do there is, we have this large automobile collection that's in a separate part of the building now. But we're gonna tell the story of, of the panhandle oil industry history and integrate the automobiles oh, into the exhibit. So you see a connection between oil and the 20th century economic boom that was spurred by the construction of the automobile. Well, Cliff, this is a great story to tell, and we're, we're so pleased that you were able to come and join us today. And thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.